Hello and welcome everyone to this week's Cree Connect, where we aim to get you the answers to all your burning cardiovascular health and lifestyle related questions. This week, we're delighted to have Dr. Jennifer Jones joining us. Jenny is a physio by background. She's also a senior lecturer at the National University of Ireland, Galway. She's also our Director of Education and Training at the National Institute of Prevention and Cardiovascular Health. Thanks a million for joining us, Jenny. So we're going to, I think, get straight into our questions uh, this morning, as we have lots about exercise, all the way from the benefits to the available and realistic exercise options we may have, challenges when it comes to exercising, and of course, the importance of moving away from a sedentary and inactive lifestyle. So what I'll do, Jenny, is set the scene a little bit. Could you tell us maybe the difference between being sedentary and being physically inactive? I know I get that question a lot from a lot of our programme participants. Yes, Denise, so thank you and thank you for this opportunity to join the Connect um, programme. So there is a difference between the two. So physical inactivity is different to sedentary behaviour. So physical inactivity is when you're not achieving the activity guidelines. So we have recommended levels that we know benefit health and certain levels that give particular benefit. Whereas sedentary behavior is actually your sitting um, or your reclined or your lying behavior. So you can actually be physically active, for example, but you may be doing a lot of sitting, reclining or lying during your waking time. And that wouldn't be so good for your health as somebody who's physically active and also limiting their sedentary time. The ideal is obviously to be both, to be physically active and to, to limit that sedentary time. So, Yeah, exactly. Thanks for that, Jenny. It's good just to get the two definitions, I think. So we know here in Ireland, two thirds of our Irish adult population are actually not achieving those physical activity guidelines, which is, as we know, the 150 minutes. So John from Athlone would like to know, as one of these adults who's not achieving his guidelines, how is that inactivity in his lifestyle, I suppose, putting him at increased risk? And I'm assuming John meant increased cardiovascular risk. Um. You say that, Denise, about cardiovascular risk, but I think it's important to remember as well that we know quite a lot in terms of physical inactivity and in, in its links with health. So cardiovascular health is strongly linked to physical activity behavior, but also a lot of other conditions. So people who are not being inactive, oh, sorry, people who are being inactive, you know, we know it's not good for your health. It's a risk factor for many conditions besides heart disease, it's, a, it's linked to a number of cancers, it's linked to depression, it's linked to dementia, for example, it's linked to type two diabetes. There are an array of conditions that, that are linked to physical inactivity. So in terms of health, the science is very strong and we see a very strong connection. So it is a really important consideration for all of us. Yeah, I agree, Jenny. And what I put across as well on program is thinking about it, I suppose, as an independent risk factor as well. Uh, you know, just as bad as smoking or having a high blood pressure. So that's, I suppose, the important thing. And to follow on nicely there, there's a question from Mary in County Mayo, and she's wondering what is the recommended dose then of physical activity and exercise? Well, our guidelines and the research behind those guidelines suggest that 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity accumulated over the week, we know that that has many health benefits. So that's the kind of minimum threshold to be aiming for. So more is better than that, and that's important to recognize as well, but that initial aim or that initial recommendation is this 150 minutes. I will add though, that we've seen some really exciting research, you know, in the last couple of years, which has really highlighted that anything is better than nothing. And we've seen some data that would show that the people who actually get the most benefit are the people who are currently inactive, who take up even just a little bit of activity. So I would say in answer to that question, any activity is good. So even just increasing your activity a little bit would be my first recommendation. And then ultimately aiming for this first threshold where, where I repeat, but just for completeness, 150 minutes in total of physical activity over the week. Great. Thanks for that, Jenny. And then Jack, a farmer in County Roscommon. So Jack's on one of our programmes and being a farmer, he often talks about how much he uses his quad and his tractor around the land and that. 
So he's wondering, can you break this exercise up then into small bouts throughout the day? Um, or do your sessions have to be in that kind of hour or, you know, over the hour that we often hear potentially in the media? So you can break up the activity. So you can accumulate this activity over, over the week. So ideally, though, you want to be active every day. So in terms of the key messages, I suppose more is always better. But there's a, this initial threshold. So for a person who is doing quite a bit of sitting or inactivity or perhaps even is working, but in a seated position, um, the key would be to actually try to get this daily activity um, where you get that benefit on a daily basis. And you don't have to do it all in one go, I think is the key message. However, for cardiovascular health, we do know that doing more structured activity has particular benefits. So I think once you are an active person, there's ways of optimizing that activity where you do structured activity at least three times a week. So I hope that's not confusing, but um, it's really sort of, I suppose, looking at where are you at now if you're very inactive, the, the goal is actually to get up and moving. If you're already quite active, actually the goal is slightly different. It's about now structuring the activity so that you get the most from that activity. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice, Jenny. And similarly, another question, so I suppose quite different, but still, still a very important question. Um, Joanne here is sitting a lot now at a desk job because she's obviously working from home with the whole COVID situation. And she's wondering if there's any tips on how she might reduce this kind of inactive um, time at her desk. Absolutely and, and I think this is a really really important question and it's a, a question that's actually really, really relevant particularly now so mm -hmm. looking at my own behavior with the amount of time spent on a laptop on screen time. Um, my daughter for example is doing a lot more television watching than previously. Um, so we are finding that potentially we're sitting a lot more than we used to, as well as, you know, potentially having jobs where we are in desk-based desk positions. So I think the key is to, to understand the research. And the first thing is that we know that when people sit for more than nine hours, roughly about nine hours a day in total, there are really negative effects on their health. So I think the first thing is making sure we don't sit too much and breaking that up. There's also really good data, exciting data, which shows us that if we stand up even momentarily, just for you know, a few seconds even, like a few sit to stands or just move, and we do that every 30 minutes or so, we see a very different profile in terms of health, in terms of blood pressure, you know, your cholesterol levels and so on, so on, so that prolonged sitting is, is a key issue. So my advice for somebody who's in a desk-based job, which many of us are, that to um, either try to create um, using books, whatever, to raise a laptop up. A standing desk would obviously be ideal, but that does come with some investment. So I appreciate that may not be possible. But there's innovative ways that you could stand with your laptop if you can get the height level right. Taking calls on a mobile standing up, for example. So walking around pacing whenever you have a phone call instead of sitting on the phone. Um, and I think the key is to, to limit that sitting time, ideally, to no more than 30 minutes in one go. And remembering that you don't have to stand for prolonged periods to get benefit. It's really about not sitting for too long. Um, I've personally tried a couple of, you know, um, technology things which people might benefit from. And I'm not endorsing a particular product. These are just things I've tried. But I've set on my laptop because of the exact issues um, of spending huge amounts of time and losing track of time. I've set a, an app for a, a sitting timer. So it reminds me when I've been sitting for half an hour to remind me to stand up and have a bit of a move. Um, there are tools out there such as apps, such as the Rise and Recharge, which is an app designed to limit your sitting time. The My Avatar. There are a number of tools that can help people. I think the first thing is sort of recognizing, am I sitting? For too long and and can I use some tangible kind of goals to to reduce that yeah and I think that's a really good point I know myself kind of you're you can be focused on getting that 30 minutes in but it's it's almost nearly negated if you spend the other 23 and a half hours of that day seated you know so really really good tips there and thank you 
Um, we have Michael then, who is a self-confessed gym bunny, uh, specifically in the area of weight training. And Michael is wondering, are, is there different types of exercise or he believes there is and he'd like to know if he's correct in that. And then is there one type specifically that's better for his heart health overall? So that's a, that's a really good question. And I think um, if we were to look at the science, we know that there are different types of, of activity or exercise. So for example, you have what we would call aerobic activity or cardiovascular, which is, for example, in, in a gym setting would be a treadmill or a bike or a rower, for example. And then we have strength training or resistance training, which is much more about you know, muscle work specifically. And both actually carry some important benefits. So the ideal scenario is that you do, you do both. So cardiovascular exercise carries particular benefits for the heart because it helps to train the heart. It improves all sorts of heart health parameters. So in fact, it is a medicine for the heart. So I would say that kind of that type of exercise, walking, cycling, um, dancing even, climbing stairs, all of these things are examples of that type of, of activity or exercise. But we also see some really important benefits with strength. And that's you know, very relevant to our day-to-day -day living where we're having to lift objects, carry shopping. These are all important parameters as well for, for health and you know, quality of life. Yeah, excellent. Very good. And then someone who's obviously doing quite well. So I used to love jogging, but now my knees are hurting when I engage in that type of activity. So is there any way I can try and get back to it safely or any tips? Um, well, we can join the club together on the front. So um, my knees actually are creaking these days when I walk down the stairs. So I think we're reminded of our joints as we age a little bit. But um, the important thing is that we listen to our bodies and brisk walking is actually hugely beneficial. We don't have to jog to get health benefits. So I think if we do have some issues with some of our joints, it's important that we consider the most effective and safest forms of activity. And I would suggest that if jogging is, is causing some sort of irritation or um, knee pain, I would suggest that that's avoided and to change that into a nice brisk walk. And as the muscles in the legs become stronger, you may find that you can start to do a little bit of a walk jog, walk jog. Um, but sometimes if your knees are like mine, actually my knees just, I don't think I'll be able to go for long jogs because it's quite a high impact on those joints. So it does depend on the health of those joints. So choosing things that are non-weight bearing like cycling or swimming can be great, particularly if you've got knee problems or hip problems, so problems with sort of weight bearing types of activities. Yeah, I agree totally. And even I know some people and a lot of them love aqua. So once we can get back into the pool as well, that's a great way of increasing the, the exercise. Good stuff. So then uh, along the similar line, I suppose someone here looking for advice and recommendations on ways to increase participation. So she's recently started walking with friends, but she's actually finding that it's distracting her. So is there any other kind of, um, I suppose, tips or tricks we have on increasing participation? Um, the th I think my biggest tip would be that you need to enjoy the activity. So we can all have moments where we recognize we need to do more and we may be doing it out of you know, motivation for the moment, but then other things can take over because we're not particularly enjoying it. And when we enjoy an activity, we actually prioritize it. So we, we give it time naturally because it's giving us something in return. So I think the, the key to success actually is, is pursuing or trying different activities that you haven't tried before, but finding things you actually enjoy you know, I meet people in my sessions that I run who don't particularly, for example, particularly like walking. So to suggest a walking program, it may be beneficial in the short term when, you know, perhaps somebody's, you know, quite motivated at that time. But that lack of enjoyment will actually make it very difficult to keep the activity up. So try new things, I would suggest. Try things in the past that you've enjoyed, that you know you enjoy. If you're a person who enjoys being around other people, 
then it's worth considering things like classes because they're very motivating as well. You know, exercising with a friend, um, joining a, a class with a, with a buddy can also be very motivating. But the, the bottom line is enjoyment is the key to success. Yeah, I would agree. Great stuff. And then from a question in from Fred. Um, Fred's actually interested in taking part in Cree's summer cycle this year. So he's doing a lot of um, increasing of his exercise and he wants to know if it's true that you need a fitness base before you start engaging in physical activity and indeed exercise. Um, in answer to that question, it depends what your plan is. So in order to start any physical activity, you don't need a base as long as you build up gradually. And that's the key. But if your goal is to do something quite competitive or, you know, a marathon, for example, or, a, you know, a very long um, cycle ride, for example, you want to avoid injury. And the key to doing that is actually to build up gradually over time. So I think the answer to that question is it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to become more active, it's build up slowly. But if the, the goal is to do something that is far more than you've ever been doing for the moment, um, you need to avoid injury by, by pacing it and preparing accordingly. And that way you'll have success. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff. And then we have a frustrated ex-rugby player who is, um, I suppose, letting us know that he used to exercise loads as a child, a teenager, um, and well into young adulthood. But now he's finding that he just can't get his mojo back. Any advice? And I know I see this. This could be rugby. This could be football. This could be did a lot through college. You know, it's very, very similar. And then you kind of hit that th over 35s, even 40, and that exercise declines. So any tips or tricks there? I think it kind of goes back to some of the previous points we've been discussing. I, in, if individuals have particularly enjoyed activities like rugby, football, and so on, then it's it's returning to, to those potentially, but in a in a more kind of I suppose with your with your friends socially, um, as opposed to perhaps competitively or working with youngsters and doing some training in the sport, so that you're up on your feet and you're moving, but you're also sharing your your expertise and love for a particular game. It, it comes back to finding things you enjoy and things we maybe enjoyed in the past that we were perhaps in a rugby team or we were, you know, captain of football or whatever. Um, if those are the types of activities where we've been in a team sport, it may be about trying new things where you do new activities that do involve other people. It might be trying out learning to dance, for example, or, you know, trying completely new, new sports that perhaps aren't so high impact, because we have to remember that playing rugby as a 20 year old is very different to playing rugby as a 60 year old. So we have to also listen to our bodies, I'm not saying you can't play rugby, but it would need to be, it will be different to what you experienced as a, as a 20 year old. But who's to say you wouldn't start badminton or another kind of sport, if you like, that perhaps doesn't involve um, quite so much physical contact and your joints getting involved and depending on the position you play, of course. Yeah, great. I like that. And thinking about kind of adapting the exercise through the lifespan, I think is really important as well. Uh, it does actually link into our next question here from Sheila in Sligo. So Sheila is wondering if you have any advice for people who have a condition um, that's limiting their engagement in exercise. So knee arthritis, COPD, asthma. So um, Sheila herself has actually expressed that she has obesity. Um, and when she goes to her medical appointments or indeed her healthcare professional appointments, she feels sometimes like her symptoms are being maybe a little bit dismissed um, and that she's simply told to maybe move more. Uh, and obviously we all know that that's probably not that easy. How do you think Sheila can, I suppose, get started? So it's all, I think the getting started point all has to be relative to where you are at the moment. So um, my advice for Sheila would be that even we come back to the standing data, we come back to the science of simply limiting your sitting time by standing more and actually moving around more, even at a low level, it doesn't have to be fast, but you know, moving around burns actually calories, which will help her in terms of, you know, weight management as well. Um, I think if you've got particular considerations such as knee pain, knowing that 
non weight bearing activities are going to be more comfortable and give you the benefit of the exercise, whereas sometimes choosing the activities that perhaps take a lot of weight through the knees can almost aggravate the knee pain. So it's really about looking at an individual and giving some quite clear guidance. And that's where the help of Cree comes in, where Cree, you can call in and get expert help and advice on an individual level because everybody is slightly different. But doing, um, I would say, non-weight bearing activities, cycling, swimming, or even a seated exercise program, you can do a great program just sitting in a chair where you actually move all your joints, your main muscles. Um, we know that one of the main treatments for arthritis is exercise, but it's knowing what's the right exercise because you can actually help that arthritis. So it's a, it's a therapy in itself. It's a medicine for arthritis. I don't know if that answers that question, Tanisha. You might want to add to that. Yeah, no, I think it does. And I think I would often say as well, I don't know if it's an Irish thing, um, but kind of using everything that's in your toolbox, you know, pain relief if you need it, some rubs, you know, any holistic therapies you utilize, ice, heat, all those things that can get you moving because, you know, it will take time to see a training effect. So I think sometimes maybe people immediately think they should see that effect from their training. So I think, yeah, they're, they're, that's some great advice there. Then we have a slightly worried Samantha um, in Cork who is six months after a heart attack. Uh, and she's a little bit afraid to get back walking, actually. She's worried that if she pushes herself too hard, um, that she may indeed revert to where she was potentially six months ago around the time of her heart attack. Um, very common, I think, this, this is here. And have you any tips or tricks for Samantha? Um, I, I totally understand where Samantha is coming from. And, you know, the natural response might be to avoid activity in the context that you think, well, I'm working the heart. What if I was to cause harm? When in actual fact, it's the best thing you can do for your heart is actually you know, work the heart muscle at the right level because it is a muscle and it responds to the exercise and it is a medicine in itself. It, the exercise does amazing things for heart health and for protection against heart attack. So I think it's really um, that confidence. And I think it's the confidence to know that when you go for a walk and you keep your breathing comfortable you can speak a whole sentence for example you might even feel your breathing's a bit deeper and faster ideally but you've got that comfort you could have a chat you could have a conversation but you notice that your breathing is a little bit more you know a little bit more more um i suppose you know a little bit more rapid than normal a bit deeper um and that that is the ideal level that's absolutely safe it's heart healthy it's protective in fact against heart attacks and the worst thing you can do is to avoid activity because the heart is a muscle. And by not doing anything, you're actually deconditioning the heart and you're raising the susceptibility potentially for an event in the future. So I can totally understand, but try and get that confidence, try and know that it's safe. If you keep it at that, I can keep a conversation going. It feels comfortable. It's going to be safe. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose specifically for Samantha there, um, having a discussion with your healthcare professional about your cardiac rehab and your onward referral pathways that you can get after your heart attack is really uh, worthwhile as well. Um, you've, you've almost alluded to our next question, which is from Becky in Donegal. So Becky was prescribed lots of medication last year after she had a TIA, which is a mini stroke. Um, and she's just wondering on your thoughts on the, on the fact that exercise could be utilized as a medicine. I think you've alluded to it. Uh, I think it's bringing in, I suppose, all of the chronic diseases as well, not just the heart attack there and the stroke. Yeah, no, um, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that exercise is an amazing medicine. It is an exceptionally powerful treatment because it is known to, for example, lower your blood pressure. It's known to have an effect in a sort of cardioprotective effect. It even actually helps to prevent the process of your arteries furring up, for example. Um, so we can look to heart disease and see some incredible medical benefits with exercise. We also see, as you've said, across lots of other conditions. So, you know, I've mentioned some already, but 
you know, cancers, I mean, dementias, there's lots of new data on dementia that's very related to physical activity and being able to help um, in terms of Alzheimer's, um, in terms of um, see all sorts of, in fact, I could list, I could probably come, I could spend 30 minutes probably on a connect call just talking through the amazing benefits of physical activity. The issue though, Denise, is, as we're aware and you alluded into one of your previous questions is, whilst we may know it's a wonderful medicine and has huge powerful properties as a medicine, we have to recognize that it's not easy to do. And you can have all the knowledge in the world that doesn't mean you're going to do it because we have lots of considerations in our you know, individual lives. So I think the key message is reminding ourselves each day about what we can do for our health and what power we have over our own health and control we have over our own health. And remembering that small amounts of activity, small increases in our activity, however they may, small they may be, are going to be, have a medical property. They're going to bring us benefit. Um, and I, um, in terms of sort of, without sort of making this answer too long, but I'm a big believer that one of the big mistakes that I've personally made, you know, in, in before I kind of studied exercise in depth, is that I would have a goal where I would decide I would have a resolution. I'm going to become more active. And I think the biggest mistake I made is I went too big a jump to start with. And then we can fail and then we can kind of, that can put us off trying again because we, we lose confidence and we lose the motivation. So the biggest tip of all, I think, is to, if this, this Connect session has inspired you to think, yes, I could be a bit more active. My biggest bit of advice would be make it a small change. Yeah, make it a very, you know, it's a bite-sized goal and you keep moving it forward. And that way you won't cause any injuries you'll get the benefits and you'll just keep getting those benefits long term. Yeah, just brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. And we've come to the end of our questions there. So I think we've really enlightened everyone on how we might get into our activity and how we might increase that over time. Um, and kind of you've very much set the scene as well that it, it will be cha a challenge. Um, so to utilize anything you can, that will get you, you back moving. So just to thank you very much, Jenny, for joining us for this session of Cree Connects and obviously to our viewers for listening and taking the time to submit your questions and indeed for watching. Um, we do return in two weeks time and we're delighted to have Dr. Darren Moylet with us, so consultant cardiologist, and Darren's going to talk about um, valvular heart disease. So get your questions in now. You can visit www.cree.ie and email us or indeed call us on 091 544 -310. So don't forget to stay tuned to the website, all of our social media for many more exercise related resources and indeed other resources that will help with your risk factor identification, I suppose. And I'd like to thank you again, Jenny, for taking the time to join us today. And thanks to everyone at home. Take care, everyone. Chat soon.